There we go. Hi, guys, and welcome to Mrs. PM Reads. I hope you're having a wonderful day. Today, we are continuing in our story, The Help, by Katherine Stockett. Uh, some of the past videos, you may have seen Cora, my cat, and she is stalking around a little bit. If she shows up, I may have to hashtag uh, Cora sighting or something. She's getting very bold. <laughs> we are going to be in chapter 25 today, and it is entitled The Benefit. So we have been hearing all through the book about this highfalutin benefit for the Ladies League. It's going to happen in this chapter. And I am going to have to split it up into two because it's a very long chapter. In chapter 24, Celia um, just found out and came to understand that her husband, Johnny, and Hilly had really been a thing before they got together. And she now understands <clears throat> why Hilly um, is avoiding her or dissing her, so to speak. And she intends to approach her at the benefit. So we shall see how that goes. Chapter 25, and it's from no one's perspective. It just says the benefit. The Jackson Junior League annual ball and benefit is known simply as the benefit to anyone who lives within a 10 mile radius of town. At seven o'clock on a cool November night, guests will arrive at the Robert E. Lee Hotel Bar for the cocktail hour. At eight o'clock, the doors from the lounge will open to the ballroom. Swags of green velvet have been hung around the windows adorned with bouquets of real holly berries. Along the windows stand tables with auction lists and the prizes. The goods have been donated by members and local shops, and the auction is expected to generate more than $6,000 this year, $500 more than last year. The proceeds will go to the poor, starving children of Africa. In the center of the room, Beneath a gigantic chandelier, 28 tables are dressed and ready for the sit-down dinner to be served at nine. A dance floor and bandstand are off to the side, opposite the podium where Hilly Holbrook will give her speech. After the dinner, there will be dancing. Some of the husbands will get drunk, but never the member wives. Each and every member there considers herself a hostess and will be heard asking one another, is it going all right? Has Hilly said anything? Everyone knows it is Hilly's night. At seven on the dot, couples begin drifting through the front doors, handing their furs and overcoats to the colored men in gray morning suits. Hilly's been there since six o'clock sharp, wears a long taffeta maroon colored dress, ruffles clutch at her throat, swathes of material hide her body, tight fitted sleeves run all the way down her arms. The only genuine parts of Hilly you can see are her fingers and her face. Some women wear slightly saucier evening gowns with bare shoulders here and there, but long kid leather gloves ensure they don't have more than a few inches of epidermis exposed. Of course, every year, some guests will show up with a hint of leg or a shadow of cleavage. Not much is said though. They aren't members, those kind. Celia Foote and Johnny arrive later than they'd planned at 7.25. When Johnny came home from work, he stopped in the doorway of the bedroom, 
squinted at his wife, briefcase still in hand. Celia, you think that dress might be a little too um, open at the top? Celia had pushed him toward the bathroom. Oh, Johnny, you men don't know the first thing about fashion. Now hurry up and get ready. Johnny gave up before he even tried to change Celia's mind. They were already late as it was. They walk in behind Dr. and Mrs. Ball. The balls step left, Johnny steps right. And for a moment, it's just Celia standing under the holly berries in her sparkling hot pink gown. In the lounge, the air seems to still. Husbands drinking their whiskeys stop in mid-sip, spotting this pink thing at the door. It takes a second for the image to register. They stare, but don't see, not yet. But as it turns real, real skin, real cleavage, perhaps not so real blonde hair, their faces slowly light up. They all seem to be thinking, thinking the same thing, finally. <laughs> but then feeling the fingernails of their wives also staring, digging into their arms, their foreheads wrinkle. Their eyes hint remorse as marriages are scorned. She never lets me do anything fun. Youth is remembered. Why didn't I go to California that summer? First loves are recalled. Roxanne. <laughs> All of this happens in a span of about five seconds. And then it is over and they are left just staring. William Holbrook tips half his gin martini onto a pair of patent leather shoes. The shoes are attached to the feet of his biggest campaign contributor. Oh, Claiborne, forgive my cl clumsy husband, says Hilly. William, get him a handkerchief. But neither man moves. Neither, frankly, really cares to do more than just stare. Hilly's eyes follow the trail of gazes and finally land on Celia. The inch of skin showing on Hilly's neck grows taut. Look at the chest on that one, an old geezer says. Feel like I'm not a year over 75 looking at those things. The geezer's wife, Eleanor Coswell, an original founder of the league, frowns. Bosoms, she announces with her a hand to her own are for bedrooms and breastfeeding, not for occasions with dignity. Well, what do you want her to do, Eleanor? Leave them at home? I want her to cover them up. Celia grabs for Johnny's arm as they make their way into the room. She teeters a bit as she walks, but it's not clear if it's from alcohol or the high heels. They drift around talking to other couples, or at least Johnny talks. Celia just smiles. A few times she blushes, looks down at herself. Johnny, do you think I might have overdressed a little for this thing? The invitation said formal, but these girls here all look like they're dressed for church. Johnny gives her a sympathetic smile. He'd never tell her, I told you so and instead whispers, you look gorgeous, but if you're cold, you can put on my jacket. I can't wear a man's jacket with a ball gown. She rolls her eyes at him and sighs, but thanks, honey. Johnny squeezes her hand, gets her another drink from the bar, her fifth, although he doesn't know this. Try and make some friends. I'll be right back. He heads for the men's room. Celia is left standing alone. She tugs a little at the neckline of her dress, shimmies down deeper into the waist. There's a hole in the bucket 
dear Liza, dear Liza. Celia sings an, an old country fair song softly to herself, tapping her foot, looking around the room for somebody she recognizes. She stands on tiptoe and waves over the crowd. Hey, Hilly! Hello! Hilly looks up from her conversation a few couples away. She smiles, gives a wave, but as Celia comes toward her, Hilly heads off into the crowd. Celia stops where she is, takes another sip of her drink. All around her, tight little groups have formed, talking and laughing. She guesses about all those things people talk and laugh about at parties. Oh, hey there, Julia, Celia calls. They'd met at one of the few parties Celia and Johnny attended when they first got married. Julia Fenway smiles and glances around. It's Celia, Celia Foote. How are you? Oh, I just love that dress. Where'd you get that? Over at the Jewel Taylor shop? No, Warren and I were in New Orleans a few months ago. Julia looks around, but there is no one near enough to save her. And you look very glamorous tonight. Celia leans closer. Well, I asked Johnny, but you know how men are. Do you think I'm a tad overdressed? Julia laughs, but not once does she look Celia in the eye. Oh no, you're just perfect. A fellow leaguer squeezes Julia on the forearm. Julia, we need you over here for a second. Excuse us. They walk away, heads leaned close together, and Celia is alone again. Five minutes later, the doors to the dining room slide open. The crowd moves forward. Guests find their tables using the tiny cards in their hands as oohs and ahs come from the bidding tables along the walls. They are full of silver pieces and hand-sewn day gowns for infants, cotton handkerchiefs, monogrammed hand towels, a child's tea set imported from Germany. Minnie is at a table in the back polishing glasses. Abilene, she whispers, there she is. Abilene looks up, spots the woman who knocked on Miss Leifolt's door a month ago. Ladies better hold on to they husbands tonight, she says. Minnie jerks the cloth around the rim of a glass. Let me know if you see her talking to Miss Hill. I will. I've been doing a supper power prayer for you all day. Look, they're Miss Walters, old bat, and they're Miss Skeeter. Skeeter has on a long-sleeved black velvet dress scooped at the neck, setting off her blonde hair, her red lipstick. She has come alone and stands in a pocket of emptiness. She scans the room, looking bored, then spots Abilene and Minnie. They all look away at once. One of the other colored helpers, Clara, moves to their table, picks up a glass. Abilene, she whispers, but keeps her eye on her polishing. That the one? One what? One who taken down the stories about the colored help? What's she doing it for? Why is she interested? I hear she been coming over to your house every week. Abilene lowers her chin. Now look, we got to keep her a secret. Minnie looks away. No one outside the group knows she's part of this. They only know about Abilene. Clara nods. Don't worry, I ain't telling nobody nothing. Skeeter jots down a few words on her pad, notes for the newsletter article about the benefit. She looks around the room, taking in the swags of green, the holly berries, red roses, and dried magnolia leaves set as centerpieces on the table. Then her eyes land on Elizabeth, a few feet away, ticking through her handbag. She looks exhausted, having had her baby only a month ago. Skeeter watches as Celia Foote approaches Elizabeth. 
when Elizabeth looks up and sees who she's been surrounded by, she coughs, draws her hand up to her throat as if she's shielding herself from some kind of attack. Not sure which way to turn, Elizabeth? Asks Skeeter. What? Oh, Skeeter, how are you? Elizabeth offers a quick, wide smile. I was feeling so warm in here. I think I need some fresh air. Skeeter watches Elizabeth rush away at Celia Foot rattling after Elizabeth in her awful dress. That's the real story, Skeeter thinks. Not the flower arrangements or how many pleats are around the rear end of Hilly's dress. This year, it's all about the Celia Foot fashion catastrophe. <laughs> Moments later, dinner is announced and everyone settles into their assigned seats. Celia and Johnny have been seated with a handful of out-of-town couples, friends of friends who aren't really friends of anyone at all. Skeeter is seated with a few local couples, not President Hilly or even Secretary Elizabeth this year. The room is full of chatter, praise for the party, praise for the Chateau Briand. After the main course, Hilly stands behind the podium. There is a round of applause and she smiles at the crowd. Good evening. I sure do thank y'all for coming tonight. Everybody enjoying their dinner? There are nods and rumbles of consent. Before we start the announcements, I'd like to go ahead and thank the people who are making tonight such a success. Without turning her head from the audience, Hilly gestures to her left, where two dozen colored women have lined up dressed in their white uniforms. A dozen colored men are behind them in gray and white tuxedos. Let's give a special round of applause to the help for all the wonderful food they cooked and served and for the desserts they made for the auction. Here, Hilly picks up a card and reads, in their own way, they are helping the league reach its goal to feed the poor starving children of Africa, a cause I'm sure dear to their own hearts as well. The white people at the tables clap for the maids and the servers. Some of the servers smile back. Many though, stare at the empty air just above the crowd's heads. Next, we'd like to thank those non-members in this room who have given their time and help, for it's you who made our job that much easier. There is light applause, some cold smiles and nods between members and non-members. Such a pity, the members seem to be thinking. Such a shame you girls haven't been <laughs> gentilly enough to join our club. Hilly goes on thanking and recognizing in a musical patriotic voice. Coffee is served and the husbands drink theirs, but most of the women kept rapt attention on Hilly. Thanks to Boone Hardware, let us not forget Ben Franklin's dime store, she concludes the list with, and of course, we thank our anonymous contributor of <clears throat> supplies for the Home Health Sanitation Initiative. A few people laugh nervously, but most turn their heads to see if Skeeter has had the gall to show up. I just wish instead of being so shy, you'd step up and accept our gratitude. We honestly couldn't have accomplished so many installations without you. Skeeter keeps her eyes on the podium, her face stoic and unyielding. Hilly gives a quick, brilliant smile. And finally, special thanks to my husband, William Holbrook, for donating a weekend at his deer camp. She smiles down at her husband, adds in a lower tone, and don't forget, voters, Holbrook for State Senate. The guests offer an amicable laugh at Hilly's plug. What's that, Virginia? Hilly cups her ears, then straightens. No, I'm not running with him, but Congressman with us tonight, 
if you don't straighten this thing out with the separate schools, don't think I won't come down there and do it myself. There is more laughter at this. Senator and Mrs. Whitworth, seated at the table in the front, nod and smile. At her table in the back, Skeeter looks down at her lap. They spoke earlier during the cocktail hour. Mrs. Whitworth steered the senator away from Skeeter before he could give her a second hug. Stuart didn't come. And we are going to stop this chapter about the benefit right here because we're about in the middle. And we will pick it up in part two. So thank you guys for joining me. For Mrs. PM Reads, I hope you have a wonderful day and I look forward to seeing you next time. Bye.